This is Neil Ross, the voice of Mirai, and you're watching Guilty Gaming. Hey everyone, Guilty here, and today is a great day. I have a special guest with me, the one and only Neil Ross. If his name does not sound familiar, maybe you would recognize him as the voice of the Codex from the Mass Effect trilogy, Colonel Volgan from Metal Gear Solid 3, Mayor Domino from the Final Fantasy VII Remake, or what is most relevant to my channel, Mirai from Ninja Gaiden. To tag him as a voice actor would be an understatement considering his gargantuan resume. He is an author, a veteran, a husband, and a father, and I have the pleasure of hosting him today to talk about his work, his talent, his book, maybe some music, and maybe we'll exchange brief tales of time overseas. Neil, once again, thank you, thank you very much for uh, joining me this morning. Oh, no problem, my pleasure. I'm not the only Neil Ross. Uh, I, Like every other egomaniac, I've Googled myself, and it turns out there's a doctor in Australia and a rugby player in Scotland who have both stolen that name. <laughs> and they'll be hearing from my attorneys. As uh, they should. Within the hour. Well, none of them were, were born in Britain under the threat of airborne ordinance from Nazi Germany. Right. None of them moved to Canada for a spell and suffered through the winters there. Well, I was a kid, so I didn't know any better. I thought it was most of the time it was fun. You know, we got to build uh, snow forts and, and play hockey and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, nobody told me that, that winter was a big problem. I would hear my father complaining about it frequently, but I thought it was great. As much as I enjoyed the the wilderness of Alaska, even though I was maybe 10 minutes away from downtown, the snow wore on me uh, very quickly. And I guess it, it wore on, uh, on, your, on your father because it was your father who convinced your mother to uh, pack your bags and move to California. Yeah, he was in a bar one night and a blizzard happened and he emerged and to find his car completely covered in snow. There's a cop scraping the snow away so he can stick a ticket on the windshield and nice. my father claims that he rose to great heights of oratory and said that's it i'm leaving this miserable country uh because see he had come out to visit relatives in california and he he arrived in in, a, in december and he must have hit what was called a santa Ana out here where the winds blow in from the desert and it's actually warmer than normal right and he came back with tales of milk and honey in this land of wonder where one could uh, go swimming in the morning and be skiing in the afternoon, which is theoretically possible. And I suppose a few maniacs have done it, but it's mm. not as easy as it sounds. But that was his story, and he was sticking to it. And the other thing was, wonder of wonders, the liquor stores were open on Sundays. Yeah. I mean, what, you know, so... He put on the six month campaign and finally wore my mother down and off we went and, and it was to the land of uh, where palm trees grow and rents are low, which they were when <laughs> Neil Diamond time. wrote that song. They no longer are. No. Um, and it was um, it was around that time where uh, you discovered your uh, your love for rock music. I was reading last night uh, how you uh, came across Elvis Presley and before that Little Richard, right? Yeah, Little Richard actually happened in Montreal. Uh, heard that on the radio, and that was that was the I was there was no turning back. Right, <clears throat> I had never really liked music up to that point, but the minute I heard Little Richard sing "Tutti Fruity," I said, "Well, this is what I have been waiting to hear my entire life," which right. at that point was about eleven years. And I went off in search of rock and roll, tuning up and down the dial. And we got to California. And shortly after we arrived, a guy named Chuck Bloor took over a station called KFWB, and he flipped it to Top 40. And I became a fanatic. I just listened to that station, as, you know, every chance I got. Nice. And that eventually led to me becoming interested in perhaps becoming a disc jockey, which is how I started out. Right. And then I spent far too long in the radio business, but I didn't know any better. And, uh, well, I, eventually I did know better, but it took me a while to put all the pieces together to transition into voiceovers, mm -hmm. which is what happened. I've always been, um, I guess, envious of DJs and radio personalities. What you would sadly find if you got into the radio business is, uh, unless you were 
really in a unique situation you wouldn't get to play anything you like yeah that's that you sounds told good. what to play i mean the dj creates the illusion hey i'm just here doing my thing i'm picking all these no 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 they're looking at a list that comes from high above and uh any other music isn't even physically in the studio it's you know and if you bring something from home and play it you'll be fired you play yeah. what you know like the old George Carlin bit here. I am on boss radio playing the boss hits that my boss told me to play. And that's kind of the radio business, boys and girls. And that's one of the first things you discover uh, that sort of takes the fun out of it. But um, if you're willing to accept uh, the rules, then off you go. Well, I mean, and you had to accept more rules because it wasn't too long after you arrived in the States that uh, you enlisted. No. Uh, uh, the reason I got in the military was they were threatening to draft me. You know, I, I should have stupidly listened to some of the newscasts that I was reading at the time where they kept mentioning this country called Vietnam and this war that was going on. And it never seemed to occur to me that I might be asked to participate. Suddenly I get this draft notice and I do the physical and they put a certain chunk of us in a room and a guy with a uniform walks in and says, congratulations. And I thought, oh, perfect. I failed. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, no, he's in this military. He wouldn't congratulate me for failing. Oh, God. And so I cleverly beat the draft by joining the Navy. But I never would have uh, done that without uh, the draft bearing down on me. I am not... Uh, I survived it. I did okay, but I'm not someone who functions well in a, in, in a, in a strict hierarchy. Well, you, you did your time and you uh, played the boss's music. You danced to the boss's yeah. tune for, for a short spell. Uh, I was reading up on your time in Hawaii. I was gifted with a, a three-week uh, assignment to Pearl Harbor. I had a great time. I, I don't know if I would enjoy living there, it's a lovely, magical place, and I, I'm so happy, so grateful that I was able to be there for five years. Five years. And I could conceivably have stayed longer, uh, but I had, uh, I had things I wanted to do, and I knew that I could not accomplish them in in Hawaii. I needed to be on the mainland. Yeah, I think you got a call back uh, from from California. And that was, that yes, I was offered a job at KCBQ in San Diego, which was a big station at that time. And uh, actually a station that I had listened to when I lived in San Diego as a kid, you know, I, I started listening to KCBQ, I think in the ninth grade. So the idea of getting back to what I considered my hometown, you know, we did so much traveling, I don't really have a hometown, but that, that kind of was my hometown. That's where I went to junior high and high school. And the idea of being back there on a happening radio station uh, yeah. was just irresistible. You were still in Hawaii when you uh, got to meet Jim Morrison? I was just out of the Navy. Yeah, I was out. I'd been out a few months. And that's when uh, the doors came to Honolulu. And the station I was working for uh, essentially promoted the concert, which gave us... Actually, we were ordered to go backstage by, by the promoter who was f frightened of the doors. She said, they're crazy, they're maniacs, anything may happen. I need you guys backstage to deal with these, with these guys. You know, everybody was sort of afraid of Morrison because no, <clears throat> we really didn't know anything about the band. You know, Rolling Stone magazine had only just started publishing. And, you know, the only thing I'd read about him was a piece that Joan Didion wrote, I think that was in Look magazine, and uh, she portrayed them as being very weird. And Morrison hopped up on a training table. This was at the Honolulu International Center. And it was a venue that where they did a lot of sports. So backstage was basically lockers and a training table and a mirror and showers, you know, perfect for a basketball team, not so great for a rock band. But anyway, he hops up on the training table. Nobody wants to go near him. I finally, you know, said, well, I guess I better bite the bullet. And I jumped up and introduced myself and then offered him a beer, Yep, which is another whole story. The, the guy who was in charge at the time of the arena said, uh, there will be no alcohol backstage and there will be no profanity. If there's any profanity, the show will be shut down. And so we smuggled a case of a beer into the, uh, 
into the backstage area. We put it, we were very clever. We put it in a large cardboard box and wrote radio equipment, <laughs> fragile, yeah. do not open. And uh, we, so we had a case of beer under the training table. So I said, Jim, would you like a beer? And I got this dazzling smile. Yes, I'd love a beer. So we opened beers. I offered him a Marlboro, which I was stupidly smoking in those days. He mm -hmm. accepted and we sat there and we smoked our cigarettes and we sipped our beer and uh, we had a very nice conversation. He seemed like a, almost a shy person. But I've read a lot about him since, and apparently he was one of those people who is absolutely charming until they take that sixth or seventh drink, and then they turn into a monster. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever encountered anybody like that, but supposedly that's the way he was. Well, I, we never got to the sixth or seventh beer, so he was fine. But yeah, that was the image you painted of him. Well, it was, a, it was just a different time, you know? A lot of the excess stuff that you read about rock bands doing that came later i i saw an interview with ray manzarek and he said we more or less invented stadium rock and i think he was right you know it's like how do we do this in a huge place the whole thing evolved i remember seeing jethro tull in san diego and it was outdoors and it was in the daytime and they had this thing called tull o vision which was a giant screen and yeah. they were photographing the band up close and it was playing on the giant screen but it didn't work very well the picture was not too good and but that's the first time now it's standard they've all got these giant screens behind them and cameras catching close-ups so if you're you know watching seeing the the stones at dodger stadium and you're yeah. up in the bleachers well you've got a close-up of mick on the screen True. but all of that stuff had to evolve and at the time the doors played this almost ten thousand seat arena it was very new and the ethos of the musicians in those days now we know they were doing stuff they shouldn't have done you know they sort of portrayed themselves like us you know smoking a little weed here and there maybe mm. dropping acid who <laughs> knows but actually a lot of them were shooting heroin which at yeah. the time their fans would have said you're what yeah no needles Ugh. yeah of course you know well nonetheless you got to meet jim morrison that's got to make for good uh for good talk with anybody you might meet for the first time I, as I was speaking, I didn't even consider that since then you could one up your own one up story and be like, well, yeah, well, I was the announcer for the 75th Academy Awards or was it the Golden Globes? No, it was the Academy Awards. Academy Awards. I have never done the Golden Globes. And from the way things are going, it doesn't seem like I ever will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe there won't be any. Yes, I did do, get, get to do the Academy Awards one year. You know, in our business, that's sort of considered uh, scaling Everest. Mm. Well, you're, yeah, you're live in front of yeah. tens of millions of people just in this country, right? You didn't know how many worldwide might have been watching. It's funny. We had just shy of 40 million in this country, and they said, they said that was a disaster. And now they'd kill for 40 million oh, yeah, viewers. But, um, yeah, it, uh, it, it's a unique thing in that, uh, well, when I, the second time I auditioned for the job, that's when I met the guy who would direct uh, the show, an amazing guy named Louis J. Horvitz. And he had actually heard me on the radio uh, in previous years. And he said, oh, you've got a radio background. That's good. You're used to being on live. And it didn't really register with me at the time. But most voiceover people, unless they came out of radio, they've never been live any, in anything. I mean, right. the voiceover job, you cruise in and uh, maybe you'll nail it on take six or seven, or if things go especially bad, take 46 or seven. But, <laughs> you know, the idea of being live and then, of course, disc jockey work, you are live, but you have some control, you know, if things go horribly wrong you quickly roll a record and try to figure out how to regroup and and, and get back on on schedule but uh, academy awards you are live and you don't control nothing except yeah. this little red button which when you push it turns the microphone on other than that this show is rolling like a giant uh, wheel and you're one of the cogs and you better mash baby or yeah. the thing will roll right over you and right. uh, so it was uh, yeah, probably one of the more intense experiences in my life 
And of course, you're functioning with little or no sleep. The, the rehearsals just went from like nine in the morning till midnight or later. Gosh, was that 2001 or was that in the late? 2003. 2003. Okay. And so that comes sort of uh, in the middle of your, uh, for lack of a better word, filmography. Uh, our correspondence began with an email I sent to you regarding your work as Mirai in the Ninja Gaiden reboot, uh, which was released on the original Xbox way back in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I've been a particular fan of this version of the game. I never played the uh, original that came out on Nintendo. My parents uh, couldn't afford it. I'm sure other people can relate. Uh, so I had Candyland to occupy my time, not so much Nintendo. And uh, in the years since the game came out in the early 2000s, uh, my fanaticism has just increased. I I have a big wall scroll, a big poster over here. I mean, my, my YouTube presence, it's 350 subs, and people come out to watch me play a game, which 10 years ago, that probably would have been a wild idea to have. Like, I'm just going to play, and people are going to watch. But there's a much bigger community of people for this game than, than just me. And um, the borderline fanaticism, the obsession with you know getting the most points and finishing the game the quickest uh, has just brought more people in that didn't play it when it first came out. And there's going to be a, a remaster and a re-release just next month. So you already have a, a big group of people that have heard your voice as, as Mirai. And now you're going to have new players picking up this game hmm. and they're going to hear your voice and they're, they're not going to know who you are, but they're going to know you as Mirai, just like I do. I forever will associate that character with you and your voice. This, this person, this video game character is as much you as you are you or as much as I am me. Memory uh, gets foggy naturally. And recalling your time on a specific game or property, especially almost 20 years ago, um, may have uh, waned. But I know that people have, have come up to you and uh, expressed some of these sentiments like, wow, you are, you're the guy. What was it like to work on this game? And, and that was what kind of started it with you. And, and my, my question is, we already said you're a modest, humble person. What goes through your head when somebody like me approaches you and says, you are this guy. I will never, ever associate anybody else's voice with this person. Well, I, you know, that's a lovely thing to have happen. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of it. The problem is if they ask me to talk about, you know, the recording sessions and what happened, because most of the time I, I have no memory of this stuff which sounds weird, but you got to remember that usually it's one session of four hours duration, and I'm able to knock out everything they need. Once in a while, I get brought back for a second or even a third time, but most of the time it's four hours and done. Right. When people want to talk about animation stuff, okay, I did 65 episodes of whatever, mm. there are many, many sessions. Yes, I have all kinds of memories and stories, but uh, one four-hour period out of my life. And the thing is, it, it gets made into a game, and then people like you play it over and over and over again, and my voice gets drilled into their head. Yeah. But I've moved on. I'm working on, you know, and, and now you talk about something that happened 15, 20 years ago. It's, uh, I just don't have, I literally have no conscious memory of doing that job. Yeah. I, after our initial correspondence, I went on YouTube and I found some uh, stuff out of the games and I heard myself and I said, well, that's you. You obviously did this, yeah. but I couldn't tell you who directed it. I couldn't tell you where it was recorded. I have no, I, I, until you and I talked, I would have walked into, a, well, I would have checked IMDB first, yeah. but I would have walked into a court of law and sworn on a Bible that I had never done this job. Wow. Uh, so that's my problem. Uh, I'm grateful that people remember anything, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have good stories to tell. Maybe I should just make stuff up. That's well, that's <laughs> the other thing. When you do these games, you work alone, and a lot of what happened in animation, where the fun stories are, is interacting with the other actors. Right. But again, the 
and and the games well and the animation you're playing a part and there are storylines and you know the whole thing whereas uh games you're just doing lines in the clear essentially you're interacting with the player but the player is not there yeah and so you have a line like uh, if you take a step closer i'll kill you or whatever and it's there's there's no story to lead up to that you don't even know who you're talking to or why or yeah and a lot of times the people directing these games are kind of hazy you know and you'll say what's going on here why am i saying this well i don't really know uh, <laughs> you just are. oh good well that makes both of us charlie yeah, <laughs> yeah that was um that was good. another question uh can you explain the process of, of recording lines for for a game in your book you state you're more or less given your lines without context and mm -hmm. i know you're an actor so it's appropriate to have expectations oh this man or woman this person is an actor this is what they do my expectation is they will churn out quality work but how do you churn out quality work with no scene to play with uh, no one to really provide immediate feedback how do you crank up the energy from zero to 60 I probably owe that ability to uh, the late, great Wally Burr, who directed the uh, G.I. Joe and Transformers. And he, uh, you know, lovely man, not a malicious bone in his body. I loved him and a big part of my career I owe to him. But some of the things he did could be incredibly frustrating. And he would interrupt, let's say you're doing you know, the other actor saying, I'm going to kill you. And your line is, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> well, he's doing, I'm going to, and Wally would keep cutting it off and cutting it off. And I would come in with my line, but he'd just hit the button. Oh, we need that again. We need that again. And after about 10 or 15 takes, I'd finally give up and just sit in a chair. And finally, the guy would get the line right. And then Wally would be looking like, where are you? Why aren't you doing your line? And well, I did it 15 times, yeah. Wally. You just didn't hear it. <laughs> so you had to crank it up from zero to 60 in a split second. And as a result of that happening innumerable times with Wally, I'm just able to do that. I look at a line and I can sort of invent quickly invent a little backstory for why that line may be happening. And then I can just, uh, just do it. Right. And it may, it's sort of generic because I don't have a feed line. Sometimes the other actor feeds you their line and, and it's something you didn't expect. You thought you knew how they were going to do it, but they do it differently. So you react differently and something happens magically and organically. Well, that can't happen in a game situation. I just have to go with a generic read that seems to fit the situation and hope it works. I'm just wondering, like, they just send you a script in the mail do you get to look over things before you report uh, to no wherever they don't you go? Uh, basically you walk in and they hand the script to you and you go to work i've never confirmed this but my parents told me they were listening to uh an interview on national public radio with james earl jones mm. uh, according to them uh, the, the interviewer said well i understand you're doing voiceovers now that must be an easy buck and Joan said, on the contrary, it's the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. And the uh, interviewer said, why? And he said, well, when you do a film or a play, you get the script months in advance. You have time to research and think about it and, and rehearse and prepare. It's voiceovers, you walk in and they thrust a script at you and expect you to perform instantly. And that's pretty much voiceovers. Um, you know, once in a while, I'll get a script ahead of time. And of course, I read it and try, do whatever preparation I can. But 99% of the time, no, you walk in, here you go, ready? Jeez. I mean, animation, they rehearse. Right. Some rehearse, some, some don't. I did a series called uh, the, the Adventures of O.G. Readmore. This is a million years ago. No one will remember it. Very clever scripts. We just walked in and they rolled tape. And the lines I did were as big a shock to me as they were to the audience. And <laughs> it, it was amazing how good it turned out. Of course, we had a wonderful cast of, of solid pros, except for me, but somehow <laughs> I managed to, to muddle through. Right. But um, yeah, most of the time when I was doing uh, Nova for public television, God, they were wonderful. They would mail me the script uh, about 10 days ahead of time. And 
a video cassette of the or a dvd whatever was uh, of the show with a temp track so i could watch the show and i would know what kind of music was going to play under yeah. this scene and where everything was going to fit i mean i was it was so wonderful but you don't get that 99 percent of the time at all i've done documentaries where you say well what's the mood here what what kind of music are we going to hear and oh you don't know we haven't picked it yet that's just crazy to me uh, i sent you a link to a a commercial that i did when i was in mississippi when i was active duty uh the base pa office was developing a new app and i auditioned for, for the lead role and i, I got it at, at least i had some direction at least i was told like yeah you know be excited tone it down a little bit you're coming off creepy <laughs> <laughs> try to be a bit more persuasive it was good to sort of get that, that that feedback so i just couldn't imagine you get a lot of direction don't misunderstand me you just don't get to see the stuff in advance uh, uh but no they uh there's all kinds of direction trust me yes okay. i won't say who but a prominent voice actor once took me aside and said you know those who can't act direct and those who can't direct really direct <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's true no i there's no shortage of direction in voiceovers mm. trust me i see in fact i again i won't say who but an engineer told me that he worked with a quite well-known celebrity on camera celebrity who was dabbling in voiceovers and they did this long session the engineers tidying up the session is over and he looks through the window and the actor is just sitting in on, on the stool staring at the floor. And so finally the engineer goes in and says, well, we're, we're done. Um, anything else I can help you with? And the actor raised his head, looked him in the eye and said, you just can't have an ego in this business, can you? He had been so beaten up by this direction he was getting oh, wow. that, that, that he was utterly dispirited. That brings to mind another story. I, I auditioned for a, a commercial. It was a man, woman situation, boy, girl, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. I can't remember. But anyway, the guy who was producing it, he gave us this long explanation of, of, of the commercial. And then we read it. And then he said, uh-huh, that's okay. And then he went into another long explanation of what, and then we did a second take, another long explanation. <laughs> we did a third take. Thank you for coming in. Off we go. And I didn't know this woman very well, but I'd seen her in movies and television shows. And we're walking down the street toward our cars and she just starts laughing, you know? And I said, what's, what's so funny? And she said, honey, I have done entire movies with less direction than that clown just gave us up there for this stupid radio commercial. <laughs> yeah, that's voiceovers, gang. How much backstory do you need for a commercial? My goodness. Yeah. Well, apparently he felt we needed a lot because. <laughs> you have obviously a, a lot of experience. Uh, your resume is, is lengthy films like Back to the Future Part Two. I had no idea that was you doing the Biff Tannen Museum. Uh, cartoons such as Rambo and the Forces of Freedom, and I picked that out specifically because I had a couple of VHS tapes of that cartoon when I was very, very young. I remember that distinctly, that and uh, He-Man. And uh, obviously, video games, that's, that's why we're discussing uh, your career. What I find conspicuously absent, especially in, in the current market, is Japanese animation. Have you ever been approached to dub an anime? Well, sort of. Uh, Voltron was an already existing Japanese, or actually it was two different Japanese shows that they mashed up into one series. True. I don't know if Voltron would be considered anime or not. Other than that, no, I've never been approached or asked or it's just never happened. And that's, that's just, that's weird to me. I find that strange. I, I don't know anything. Clearly, uh, you're the voice actor. I'm not. Uh, it just seems like there is just such a huge market. Uh, there's just different shows being pumped out all the time. And I just find it hard to believe they're tapping the same few people for each of these shows. And I, I figured with, with you and, and the amount of work you've done and how long you've been in the industry, how could it, how could it not have made its way to you? 
I don't know, but as you can no doubt observe, um, I'm I'm no longer a young man, <laughs> and it may be that you know I'm sure that younger people are in control of this stuff, and they probably want to work with folks their age, and there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, to them, I'm very old school. Are you still engaging in projects or are you retired? Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm I'm still in the game. I describe myself as semi-retired. <laughs> you don't mind if I refresh my martini here? No, not I'll at right all. back with you. There we go. <laughs> Here's an oldie but a goodie, which nobody will get. Oh, that's good booze. <laughs> That's Jackie Gleason as Reggie Van Gleason the Third. Mmm, that's good booze. And then Johnny Carson stole that voice for the Tea Time movie host. Do you have like a, a, a catalog of voices that you just sort of mentally tap into? I don't know. I, don't, I can't do a voice to save my life. And I don't know how y'all do it. You know, that's an interesting question. No, I really don't have a catalog of voices. There are certain voices like the one I just did that amuse me, and it's fun for me to try to reproduce them. But, it, you know, the, the odds that there would be some show that would want that voice that I just did are, are minuscule. So really, and uh, I credit uh, voice actor Michael Bell with coming up with this concept. He said, what we're doing is playing vocal Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> and you're familiar with Mr. Potato Head, which I has am. become politically controversial. <laughs> For yeah. some reason. Yeah. But anyway, it's a lot of noses and mouths and mustaches <laughs> and ears. And you change the face by putting these various things on the oval. Well, we're doing that vocally. And uh, so it, the character is an old man. Where is he an old man down here? Is he an old man up here? Would he have an underbite? You just start fooling around <laughs> until somebody across the glass goes, that's that's that we like. Stick with that. <laughs> Is this something you can learn? I suppose to a degree, but I, you know, I was fooling around with this stuff when I was like six, seven years old, imitating voices that I heard coming out of the radio and the record player. Uh, and it was just organic, just spontaneous. There was no thought of, a, oh, this will be my life's work. <laughs> it was just fun to do. Yeah. And uh, my father thought he had a mental case on his hands and maybe he did. But so, you know, over time, some people have, come to me and say, could you teach me how to do this? And I, I, I say, I honestly don't know. Uh, I think if you were meant to do this, you'd be doing it by now. Right. And people actually do do voices. They don't realize it. You know, I'll meet somebody and, and they'll say, oh, I couldn't do a voice to save my life. And their dog comes in the room and they go, oh, yes, a little boy. Is he a boy? He's a nice doggy. And I say, that's a voice. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. And now they're all self-conscious. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I think it's, you know, a gift to a degree. Yeah. And if you had sort of some bent in that direction, I'm sure it could be improved by a good teacher. But if it's something that you haven't been doing since, uh, you know, relatively early on, maybe maybe it's just not your thing. I don't want to make fun of anybody. It's, it's almost like a, a sort of Tourette sometimes. I get locked into a voice and I can't stop. And my wife, on occasion, has gotten really angry. It's like, if you don't stop doing that, I'm packing up and leaving. And it's like, oh, God. it's just a compulsion to do yeah. that voice. <laughs> I, I went through a short spell where I kept pronouncing sorry, sorry. And I don't know if it was because we were in the north or we, we drove through Canada on our way out of Alaska. I don't know if I picked it up then, but I'd be like, sorry. And my wife was like, I will divorce you in the middle of this road trip if you don't stop saying it that way. And I'm like, sorry, I couldn't shake it for well, I was I was much more annoying. I, I was doing Henry Kissinger all <laughs> day long, you know, and I started calling my wife Nancy because that was Henry's wife's name, but it's not her name. And uh, I couldn't stop. I think it was Freakazoid. They had a, a Henry Kissinger character, but his Henry Kissinger was nothing intelligible whatsoever. And I was like, that's mildly accurate. Yeah, I did an unintelligible character in, um, oh God, a Harvey Birdman. Yes. 
And that I was saw, that was really difficult. It's like just do gibberish. Well, try it sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, Volturo, if I remember. Yes, yeah. Yes. Oh yes. my God, I, I found that, that very difficult to do. Because someone is the genetic parent of a child, does that make him the one most fit to raise said child? Ladies and gentlemen, joy today. We should have people in the Quest family up close who can give us insights into real things that they best. Parent is for these two adorable young boys. Oh, I love that show so much. Did you? Did you interact with people on that show? My memory is that I worked alone. Man. I think cool. they worked. Uh, I did one session with somebody else, but most of the time I worked alone. That's nuts. Like Just because it's just the interaction, everything about that show is. It's funny. It, it compl the, the whole business completely changed in the 80s. They insisted everyone must be present for every session. If you cannot be present for every session, we will hire somebody else you know yeah. it was uh, written in stone and then time went by and suddenly they're all working the actors separately and why that change came about i don't know i'm thinking maybe because they started using a lot of celebrities and those folks are only available when they're available and you, if you threaten to fire them they go solid i'm doing two movies what yeah. do i care about your stupid little show yeah right so uh they sort of i think they got used to working people separately and um They've been doing it in features all along. I remember uh, reading um, Angela Lansbury, and okay. she did uh, something for Disney, and she talked about how difficult it was to act alone without the other actors. But that's the way they like to do it in features. They like to get each line in the clear, and then they glue them together. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I did a scene uh, in An American Tale with uh, Madeline Kahn, and I was such a huge fan of hers. Never met the woman. Wow. You know, I, I did my lines alone. The uh, director uh, fed me her lines and then they glued it all to she worked somewhere else some other time and they glued it all together. It works pretty good, but I just uh, I'm always haunted by the thought that maybe if we had worked together, it might have been a little bit better. I don't know. Yeah. Hard to say. That's. I mean, so there's some roles that you did and um, this is also relevant. Uh, Mass Effect, that trilogy is being remastered and there, there's a big hype around it because they're taking the first game that I think came out in 2007 and they're like redoing the textures and they're redoing character models to make it more consistent with the later games because they obviously made better developments in the later games. So they're being all packaged together and that's coming out on the 14th, this Friday. Mm. And you were the voice of the Codex. Which right. I you I think you wrote in your book reams of paper, because mm -hmm. you say so much, but you also acknowledge the codex is like this much of the entire game, the entire narrative. It's so astonishing to me. I the first uh, game I ever did, I think it was 1990. And it was called Stunt Island, mm. and I had nine lines. And I remember the director saying, you only have nine lines because that's all we have room for. <laughs> the game came out on floppy disks, yep. if anybody remembers those. And here we are, 1990, you know, 30 years later. And I mean, I, I remember working on a, a Mass Effect session. And in another room, they had this giant Mass Effect banner, which every, every actor had signed. And they asked me to sign it. Nice. which I did. And it was just, uh, I don't know how many names. Yeah. And every one of them had a time. And I was reading, you know, the phone book. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow they fit all that on this, on these little discs. Yeah. It's just amazing. And I remember walking out of the stunt Island session thinking, well, I don't think this is going anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did I know? Yeah. How did it feel to sign that banner? I mean, you were, that's you, like, I am a part of this, I'm part of this community, enough to probably occupy yeah. a small town. Well, the thing, the thing that struck me was, um, and now I'm going to space his name, um, oh gosh, the, the actor in Apocalypse Now. Martin Sheen, right? Yeah, Martin Sheen, thank you. And he, his narration in Apocalypse Now was just stunning. I mean, it haunted me. 
uh, for years, you know, he's in the game. And I thought he should be narrating this puppy. I mean, yeah. you know, what am I doing here? It's, uh, but uh, supposedly the reason that I got that job was because I sounded so authoritative reading this completely imaginary uh, huh. instruction manual, for lack of a better word. And uh, which is all, of course, made up stuff. I hope I'm not ruining the game for anybody. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, and the reason that I am able to do that is because of all the years in radio where I did what they call rip and read newscasts. You're, you're your own newsman. And so you roll the last record before the top of the hour and you dash down the hall to the UPI machine. Don't ask what that is. <laughs> and you tear a five minute summary off and you scan it real fast to make sure there's no typos that are going to screw you up. And then it's news, news, news from the four corners of the world. And I'm reading this news and uh, I have not read it before. <laughs> the news is as big a shock to me as it is to the audience yeah. but you you can't sound like that right so i managed to develop this very authoritative read that says i am thoroughly familiar with this material i've researched it and written it and now i'm going to present it to you and that's done that served me in good stead doing documentary stuff and 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 of course a mass effect I, it sounds like i know what i'm talking yeah. about yeah yeah it sounds like all this fake stuff is real. Yeah. So that supposedly is why they why they chose me. Jeez. Uh, I wanted to uh, congratulate you on writing a book. That's something that I've personally been trying to do for, what year is it? 20 years now. I formulated this idea when I was in high school, and it's not so high school anymore. It, it was bad. It was bad back then, but I've actually developed it into something I think is... Um, appropriate for print but you you've done it you you wrote a book and uh and it's out there now and i wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about it but i want to ask first do you have a narrator picked out for your book for the audiobook the audiobook is in the can and available oh okay darn and, i was hoping for an opportunity to help well i'm sorry you came <laughs> too late <clears throat> but uh i auditioned the entire voiceover community coast to coast and somehow or other i ended up with the job don't ask me how it's here is the book vocal recall a life in radio and voiceovers and the subtitle pretty much sums it up and as you can see it's a huge book mm. so even if it bores the crap out of you uh, it makes a great doorstop <laughs> and uh, so if you want to know more about the book uh, it's available on Amazon. The audio version is available on Audible. And you can find out more about the book by going to www.neilbook.com. <clears throat> Excuse me, N E I L B O O K dot com. Neil, Mr. Ross, uh, Mirai, I really want to thank you for your time. I, I really do appreciate it. I hope you're enjoying the weather out there in california it's allegedly may but out here in southwest ohio it might be 50 degrees why 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 i don't know what's happening i don't know what god to pray to to make it feel like it's supposed to feel like in the middle of may well we're in the middle of what is called june gloom out here which is okay by me i'm dreading the the summer mm. it gets too damn hot but uh, right now it's overcast and in the mid 60s and it probably will remain that all the way through June. A little public service announcement. If you're thinking of vacationing in California, wait till July. You left a mark with me and with uh, the community. There's the subreddit is thousands strong. And I know mm -hmm. there are, there's more people that have played the game, heard your voice than 2,2500. There's enough people out there to where they're going to re-release it and they're going to make it all pretty in 4K and as 2021 is out to be and there's going to be more people that will get to hear your voice. So uh, to me, uh, you're yeah, you're etched up here and uh, to oh, everybody you. else, you are you are that man, you are that character and uh, it's it's one to take this time to, to thank you for your work, thank you for your talent and thank God you left Canada and came here. 
Well, thank you. I always turn this around and say, I always say thank you to the audience because thanks to them, I got to spend pretty much my entire adult life doing something I really loved doing. And so few people get to do that. Most yeah. people, I got to go to work. Yeah. Uh, you and I've passion. never felt like that. Well, you gave me an hour, 15 minutes of your time, and uh, I, I had a blast speaking with you. And I, I hope uh, I hope you at least uh, are ambivalent about this interaction. <laughs> no, no, I had a good time. That's I great. Enjoyed it. Thank I, you. I, I really do appreciate your time. And uh, I got to spend an hour and 15 minutes on my favorite topic, me. Yeah. Thank you, Guilty. It's been it's been fun. Well, I'm glad you had fun. I did, too. Thank you again for your time. Holy shit. Wow. I see you have made it this far.